welcome to this module on chronic tubulo interstitial disease what is the need to do a module like this i think uh, you might actually think some of you may be well versed with this so they may, you know, they may understand what exactly it means but some of you may actually think what is the need to do a module like this so we will actually just kind of uh, uh, reiterate the importance of this now if you ask me the different causes for ckd i would say most common cause is diabetic nephropathy as i have told you already second most common cause is chronic glomerulonephritis third most common cause is vascular that is ischemic nephropathy so these are the three most common causes of ckd okay which you all know and diabetic patient over a period of time can become diabetic nephropathy all these glomerular diseases patients including membranous fsds mpg and iga all of them can actually over a period of time some of them not all of them can actually go to ckd that ckd is called chronic glomerular nephritis your ras and tma patients many of them over a period of time can actually go to ckd that is called vascular that is ischemic okay so this is a gradual transition correct from diabetes to diabetic nephropathy iga to iga nephropathy cgn or it's from a ras to a ischemic nephropathy that's also a ckd so they are basically transforming themselves to this place these are the top causes cause number 1 cause number 2 cause number 3 now if you look at the kidney structure per se 85% of the kidney is made up of tubular interstitium so what do what is a layman's uh, how does a layman define ckd layman defines ckd as a just as a decrease in nephron number in very simple terms it is a decrease in nephron number the pathologist keeps using this term called ifta gs ifta gs ifta gs that is interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy glomerulosclerosis what would we understand interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy are so very 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 important which means that as i have told you during anatomy 85% of the kidney is made up of tubular interstitium so even if you are having a cgn and your glomerulus is sclero still you cannot get ckd so diabetes cgn vascular ischemic all these things when they produce ckd have to basically involve the tubular interstitium or in other terms the moment you are saying it is ckd there should be a tubular interstitial fibrosis without tubular interstitial fibrosis you cannot see ckd because 85% of the kidney is made up of tubular interstitium or in other words fsds is there the glomeruli are completely sclerosed and that sclerosis per se cannot be called a ckd because that has to secondarily involve the tubular interstitial compartment produce tubular interstitial fibrosis then only you can say it is ckd because 85% of the kidney is made up of tubular interstitium okay so that point is very very clear so these conditions produce secondary tubular interstitial fibrosis and that is what is called a ckd correct now i am talking of a specific entity here a very 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 specific entity wherein primarily due to some cause or sometimes without a cause we are having tubular interstitial fibrosis without any particular reason sometimes and sometimes due to a particular reason without any hit previously in the vascular or in the glomerular part we are having a primary tubular interstitial fibrosis that primary tubular interstitial fibrosis is what i am actually going to classify in this particular heading called chronic tubular interstitial disease remember remember that every disease in the kidney be fsds or membranous or ras or tma finally when it becomes ckd will produce tubular interstitial fibrosis that has to be there because 85% of the kidney is made up of tubular interstitium but that is not called chronic tubular interstitial disease because that is a secondary involvement here we are going to talk about a group of disorders that are primarily going to affect your tubular interstitium and produce tubular interstitial fibrosis okay that's very 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 clear so that is what we are going to talk in this major heading called chronic tubular interstitial disease so when i am saying cgn i don't have to do a separate module on cgn because i have already done iga i have already done mpgn you know iga and mpgn go to cgn but here that is not the case as we always teach our undergraduate students uh, see iga nephropathy in few patients or in say one third going into ckd can be actually called as a cgn a ras going into a ckd is actually called as ischemic but AKI or AKI in the acute tubular interstitial compartment going into CKD is not what is called CTID. This is completely wrong. CTID is not a transformation of an ATIN. CTID is a completely different disease in itself. This is something which everyone would be knowing. But in case new PGs, first year postgraduates, etc., who are not well versed to this, for them it may be something new. This is a very important concept. You need to have this because otherwise you'll be getting completely confused. okay so uh, people who are very well versed with nephrology see i know that this particular video may be actually seen by people who are at different different levels so i need to be sure that i cater to the mass 
it's very important so that's why for some of you who are very well versed in working in good centers or pgs in very good centers and having nephrology units and well versed with nephrology for them some of these things might look too simple okay so, but please do pardon me please do understand that unlike in the past where we had only few seats now we're having a lot of seats many of the centers are not equipped with nephrology they're not having enough exposure so they are having no other platform to learn so for them we do discuss a bit of base also okay so that is not CTID. Primary tubal interstitial involvement is called CTID. So that is why in general parlance, if you ask me what is CKD, pathologists always define CKD as iftagias. That means interstitial fibrosis is there, tubular atrophy is there, glomerulosclerosis is there. So here we are actually taking out this term glomerulosclerosis because we are talking about primary diseases that involve the tubular interstitium. So the key terms that we are going to use are interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy. So that's what we are going to discuss now, interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy. On any biopsy report you see, even a normal person's biopsy report, you can see up to 5% of interstitial fibrosis or tubular atrophy is actually normal. The moment you are having interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, more than 5% of the cortical area, that is basically what is called as the CTID. Or in other terms, I would say CTID is defined as more than 5% IFTA, okay, which we have to make it a bit more clear. What is interstitial fibrosis? That is your connective tissue in the renal parenchyma. So connective tissue in your renal parenchyma is now more than 5% of the cortical area. So connective tissue in your renal parenchyma is more than 5% of the cortical area with tubular atrophy. Okay, tubular atrophy means the diameter of the tubule drops by more than 50%. So diameter of the tubule drops by more than or equal to 50%. Connective tissue in the renal parenchyma is more than 5%. That is what we actually call interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy. And that in other words leads to scarring. That in other words leads to scarring. So interstitium is fibrous, tubules are atrophic. You are having interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy. We'll see what the causes are. That is leading on to a scarring, permanent damage. That is what we actually call as a chronic tubular interstitial disease. And the most important pathogenic fibrogenic cytokine in the human body is TGF beta. And here also the central key player is going to be TGF beta. So the central key player here also is going to be TGF beta. I'll just try to take you through a few diagrams to make you understand this. Nobody has asked you CTID discussion, but you can actually see and it's a lot of fibrosis. There is a lot of fibrogenic bands, fibrogenic bands, fibrogenic bands. And that you also notice the tubular diameter. The tubules are generally called a very good back-to-back -back arrangement. You're not seeing that too much back-to-back -back arrangement. Here again, severe interstitial fibrosis. You can see complete interstitial fibrosis with collagen. That's more than 50%. And here you can actually see a lot of tubular atrophy. And here actually you can see even more than 50% of involvement. Here you can see extensive fibrosis. Okay, so this is the basic nature that we are actually going to talk about. From where do these fibroblasts come? That's actually an important question. And fibroblasts are producing a lot of TGF beta that is further actually important for you. Now, from where do these fibroblasts come? We are always talking about these cells called pericytes. Pericytes are rogue cells, okay? Pericytes are actually the vascular smooth muscle cells which are actually beneath your vascular endothelium. So the endothelium has a lining and that is basically your perivascular cell or vascular rogue cell what we actually call it or a perivascular smooth muscle cell also you can actually call it. The pericytes are the ones which are actually getting converted into the fibroblast. Okay, pericytes are getting converted into fibroblast. That is one very important thing. Second thing is that you are having an intrinsic population of fibroblasts in the kidney itself. That's a postulate but it's now been proven right and that is your GLI-1 positive progenitors. Okay, so GLI-1 <coughs> positive progenitors are intrinsic fibroblast population in the kidney. They are also situated in the perivascular region. So they start proliferating. Not only that, a lot of pericytes get converted into fibroblasts. So then a lot of fibroblasts are actually being formed and fibroblasts produce a lot of TGF beta that further promotes fibrosis and that is how the whole thing happens. So when you have this situation, what happens is the perivascular, peritubular capillaries are the ones which supply the medulla. So when you're having this loss of pericytes, loss of pericytes and pericytes being converted into something else, etc. will lead to loss of peritubular capillary. The peritubular capillary architecture itself will be lost. The peritubular capillary architecture being lost means no oxygen comes to the medulla. That will further lead on to hypoxia. Hypoxia will further lead on to TGF beta and TGF beta will further lead on to fibrosis. So hypoxia is also an important factor. So the key three questions that you have to remember here are key pathogenic fibrogenic cytokine in the body, TGF beta. Second question that you have to know is fibroblasts are they intrinsically present in the kidney or are they coming from outside? Both are correct. Intrinsic fibroblast population is a perivascular population that is GLI-1 progenitors. Second, do uh, how, how do they manage because they are a small number. 
it is the conversion of pericytes which are your vascular smooth muscle cells or rogate cells or mural cells that's the other name they get converted into fibroblasts that's also there what is the process that keeps on going that is basically because loss of peritubular capillaries happen when there is loss of peritubular capillary what happens is there be further hypoxia further hypoxia will stimulate further fibrosis this is in a nutshell what happens now let us start looking at it much more clinically so you now understood what is chronic tubular interstitial disease that understanding has to be perfect let us now see the causes for a chronic tubular interstitial disease there are lots and lots of causes here there are so many ways of actually looking at it also there are so many kinds of classifications also we will actually try to see one by one and all of these are actually speaking very important for your exam i'll start off with drugs so, so many drugs can actually produce acute tubular interstitial nephritis, but there are only few drugs that can produce per se chronic tubular interstitial disease or chronic tubular interstitial fibrosis. When you think of chronic tubular interstitial fibrosis, the first drug that has to come to your mind is lithium. Lithium induced chronic tubular interstitial fibrosis, very, very, very important. Okay. Second drug that has to come to your mind is calcineurin inhibitors. Calcineurin inhibitors including cyclosporin tacrolimus. Okay. Cyclosporin tacrolimus. Okay, now third one is your cisplatin. Cisplatin was previously thought to be a drug which produced only acute tubular interstitial nephritis. We were thinking that it doesn't produce so much of CTID, but recent studies have shown that there are a lot of cases of CTID per se because of cisplatin itself. So this is also important. Then aristolochic acid. So this is basically what we call as Chinese herbal nephropathy or what is called Balkan nephropathy. So Chinese herbal nephropathy, aristolochic acid use. Okay, but not very common to see in our part. Number five, we are now seeing a lot of cases of proton pump inhibitor induced CTID. So, proton pump inhibitors not going to full end stage renal disease, but very be very, very careful in using proton pump inhibitors. They can produce ATI and they can now even rarely produce CTID. They can produce bone disease. They can produce hypomagnesemia. So, a lot of things or a lot of reasons for not using proton pump inhibitors. So, PPI, aristolochic acid, cisplatin, lithium, calcineur inhibitors are all very, very, very important with respect to the exam. They are the drugs which can actually produce CTID. Okay, now another drug that can actually produce intratubular obstruction and that intratubular obstruction per se can actually lead on to some degree of fibrosis later on is a protease inhibitor called indinaver. So, just try to remember indinaver also. So, these are the drugs that can per se produce CTID. All of them are important for the exam. Individual points on each drugs, what is most required for the exam, we will discuss later on. So, drugs is the first heading. Second heading that has to come to your mind is with respect to the metabolic conditions that can produce CTID. So, any metabolic condition producing CTID. Metabolic conditions producing CTID, four very, very, very important conditions. One is hypercalcemia. So, prolonged hypercalcemia can produce CTID. Two, hypokalemia. Prolonged hypokalemia can produce CTID. Three, hyperuricemia. So, high uric acid levels for a long time can produce CTID hyperoxaluria oxalate stones and obstructions that's why hypercalcemia hypokalemia hyperuricemia hyperoxaluria are the four metabolic conditions that can produce ctd always remember that obstruction invariably leads on to ctd after a long time that obstruction producing ctd is also going to be a ctd so any obstructive kind of a kidney disease bilateral weak stones like what you see with the stroite stone that is magnesium morning phosphate stones so all those things with recurrent infections stone formation stone formation etc producing a kind of a obstruction and that can also lead on to CTID. Even what we see here like hyperoxaluria producing stones, again you can actually see big big oxalate stones and then going into CTID. So that is metabolic. So drug is there, metabolic is there. So we've seen drug, we've seen metabolic. Okay, along with drugs, I think probably I should have told it just after drugs that is toxins or what we call as heavy metals. Okay, toxins are heavy metals. Inside that most important is lead. Okay, and lead is very much associated with hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia with the CTID, you have to always be thinking about lead. We will actually come to that. And cadmium, okay, lead and cadmium. Cadmium produces a lot of bone pain. That's why it's called ouch, ouch, nephropathy, etc. We will again see that. So, lead and cadmium are the two most important metals. Now, as per the table in Fihali, you can actually see arsenic, mercury, gold and uranium. But I don't want to discuss arsenic, mercury, gold and uranium because they're not very important per se with respect to your exam. But what you have to remember is the moment you think about mercury, the moment you think about gold, etc. It's membranous nephropathy that has to come to your mind. Okay, membranous nephropathy that has to come to your mind. Okay, so that is also there. So that is number three. 
Number four are your autoimmune conditions producing CTID. What are the autoimmune conditions that can produce CTID? This is very, very, very important. When you think of autoimmune causes, as we have discussed in rheumatology, most of the autoimmune conditions involve the glomerulus. They don't involve the tubule. Per se, to involve the tubule is not a common entity. Even in SLE, you see tubular disease per se is not common. Even if you get a tubular disease in SLE, it doesn't go to chronic tubular industrial disease. Very, very uncommon. There are two autoimmune conditions wherein the primary target of involvement itself may be the tubule and that can lead on to CTID in future. And those two diseases are sarcoidosis and Jogren syndrome. Very, very important. Two autoimmune conditions where the primary involvement can be a CTID and that can lead on to CKD, I mean that can actually progress and lead on to CKD. It's unlike the other diseases which are very much glomerular in origin and then can come and involve the tubule. This is not like that. That's why when you study in rheumatology, it's very important to keep in mind diseases that touch the kidney outside the glomerulus. Most of the diseases that touch the kidney are in the glomerulus. Takayasu is a disease that involves your vasculature. Pan is a disease that involves your vasculature. Sclerodermis is a disease that involves the small vessels. Sarcoid is a disease that involves the tubule. Jogren is a disease that involves the tubule. Apart from Takayasu, Pan, scleroderma, jogren and sarcoid, everything else touches the glomerulus, glomerulus first. So that's why it's very important to know that. Now sarcoidosis produces CTID, jogren produces CTID, but do remember the most common glomerular manifestation of sarcoid if somebody is asking you is membranous nephropathy. Most common glomerular manifestation of jogren if somebody is asking you is MPGN. So don't get it wrong. Sarcoid membranous is the glomerular manifestation, but overall it is the tubule or CTID is what you see. So fourth cause is autoimmune. Very, very important. Yes. So that is one, two, three and four. Cause number five, if you ask me, cause number five is a very, very, very important cause and that is reflux nephropathy. So all these congenital anomalies of the kidney when they produce CKD, they actually produce a chronic tubular interstitial disease like kind of a pattern. Most important among that is reflex nephropathy which can go to CKD. And you can even say these Kakut anomalies which are the most important cause of CKD in children, they also actually produce a CTID like kind of picture. That's basically what we call as a congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. Congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. So that is reflex nephropathy. Number six are hereditary causes. So hereditary causes mean some of these hereditary cystic diseases can actually produce CKD. And when these hereditary cystic diseases produce CKD, it's typically a CTID kind of a picture. The most important hereditary cystic disease producing CKD would be ADPKD. The second most important hereditary cystic disease producing CKD would be ARPKD. Then you have this entity called juvenile nephronophthisis. We will discuss all of them under a separate heading called hereditary cystic disorders of the kidney. So juvenile nephronophthisis. Then we have something called autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial kidney disease, what we call ADTIKD, autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial kidney disease, under which the most important one is medullary cystic disease of kidney. Just previously, the name was medullary cystic disease of kidney. Now we are actually including few more things and putting it under a different brand name called autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial disease of kidney. So that's also there. So medullary cystic disease of kidney, juvenile nephronophthysis, ARPKD, ADPKD. Don't write medullary sponge kidney here. We'll come to that. Medullary sponge kidney does not produce CKD. So ADPKD, ARPKD, juvenile nephronophthysis, ADTIKD. So this is cause number six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I have told you almost all the important things, starting from number one, most important drugs, then toxins, then metabolic, then autoimmune, then reflux, and now hereditary. And number seven, we are having a very, very, very important entity that we'll discuss at the end, where you are having no idea what we call CKDU or CKD of unknown etiology. That's gaining a lot of importance these days. Okay, so these are the things. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, everything we have discussed now. Outside this, if you look into this table, there are a few more things that are actually being mentioned. So I just want you to keep that in mind, just in case they ask you. One among that is analgesic nephropathy. Okay, analgesic nephropathy. What I want you to remember is that analgesic nephropathy is a term that we are not using these days. It's a, it's a historical term, wherein during the Second World War, we were using this combination of not we, they were using this combination of uh, phenacetin, aspirin, caffeine that produced a CTID that was called analgesic nephropathy associated with papillary necrosis and stuff. But remember, we are not actually seeing it now. We are not using the combination now. That's why I'm not quite okay with that. Then there can be certain infections that can actually produce a CTID like kind of picture. It's very rare. That's why I did mention at the end that you will see along with our module on infection that is called xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. Just the name xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis and malacoplakia. Now, these are all too rare. That's why I'm mentioning it right at the end. So, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis and malacoplakia. Okay, that's it. And third, chronic allograft nephropathy. 
or post transplant chronic rejection chronic allograft nephropathy can also produce a ctid like aneurysm so these three things you just keep it at the end what is most important i have told you so all the important causes we have actually done okay now let us see how does ctid come to us and how do we actually go about with this though so, general ctid so adpk and all you all we studied under ctid it has its own behavior but in general how does ctid come to us what are the key points in ctid that makes it a little different from the other diseases first and foremost point about ctid is ctid is the most slowly progressive among all the kidney diseases it is the most slowly progressive among all the kidney diseases why because it is just interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy that is happening so it's only after a sizable amount of interstitium is involved in tubules or atrophy that you even come to know about it. it's very very slowly progressive now this question is very important for your exam which we have already highlighted rate of fall in gfr per year okay rate of fall in gfr per year in every kidney disease is very very important for us to know I have told you that 0.8 ml per minute per year is the normal rate of fall in GFR after you are 40 years old. Till then there is no fall. After 40, there is a 0.8 ml per minute per year fall. But if you actually look into each individual kidney disease, there is a fall. Diabetic nephropathy, I have told you the fall is around 8 to 10 ml per minute per year. That's what makes it a terrible disease. CGN, if you see the fall is 6 to 8 ml per minute per year. Vascular or ischemic nephropathy, if you ask me, the fall is 4 to 6 ml per minute per year. Okay, we have seen this under CKD. Now, the most important part I want to tell you is that the fall of GFR in a CTID is 2 to 4 ml per minute per year. The fall of GFR in CTID is 2 to 4 ml per minute per year. That is one of the reasons why if you ask me, among all these kidney diseases, which is the best one if you ask me, is CTID because the rate of fall in GFR is only 2 to 4 ml per minute per year. And the second thing is that it does not recur after transplant. Whatever said and done, a vascular disease patient RAS will be unfit for transplant because he will be having occlusion everywhere. A TMA patient mostly having atypical HVS is a candidate for transplant but the problem is recurrence among the post-transplant patient is so so very high. You look at a glomerular disease patient, they may be candidates for transplant but again the recurrence may be high. MPG and etc. high recurrence, FSG is also a good amount of recurrence, IG also some recurrence, so recurrence is there. If you look at autoimmune problems, even if you transplant the kidney, they may be having problems with respect to other organs. But one entity in the kidney wherein transplant is a very good option, very very good option is CTID because it has got very slow progression so you get more time to plan transplant and it does not recur after transplant okay it does not recur after transplant right the main issue with the ckd patient is by the time you take him for transplant he may have developed so many of the other complications of uremia and that even uremic cardiomyopathy would have gone to that level that his ef would be 25 30 percent and the urologist doesn't give fitness for surgery this is something the anesthetist also doesn't give fitness for surgery. This is something that we have encountered left, right and center. You know that this patient's cardiomyopathy is because of uremia. Okay, you presume, okay, you presume that it is because of uremia. LVH would have contributed definitely. But uremic cardiomyopathy is there. EF is only 25%. You know this patient will die if he is not taken for a transplant. But the fact is that with a 20 to 25 percent ejection fraction, will he tolerate the surgery is the question of the anesthetist and the urologist and they may not actually give him fitness for surgery, which in a way is almost like equal to doom, wherein you can't actually do anything. So that's why in this disease, you get a lot of time and you basically implant it or properly. So slowly progressive doesn't recur after transplant. Most of these patients are asymptomatic. So that's why I'm the next major thing. Most of these patients are asymptomatic. They have a tubular interstitial fibrosis. So naturally, the first thing that they may come to notice is polyuria. And many of them have nocturials. Polyuria is defined as more than 3.5 liters. Some books say 4 liters in 24 hours. Nocturia is the, um, what do you say, ratio with your daytime and nighttime. Generally, it is 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1. But if it reverses, then it is actually called nocturia. Both polyuria and nocturia are symptoms of concentrating defect. And who is concentrating your urine? Naturally, I told you the major players in concentration is your tubule, medullary interstitium, ADH and all those things are there. So here because tubular interstitium is fibrosed, medullary hyperosmolality cannot be maintained. Automatically, you cannot concentrate your urine. Automatically, you will be having polyuria and nocturia. So polyuria and nocturia are the two symptoms for which generally the patient actually doesn't come to the doctor. That is why most of these patients are asymptomatic are very much asymptomatic. And incidental detection is very, very common. Okay, incidental detection while doing ultrasound for something else is very, very common. And when you detect it incidentally, you are having bilaterally small kidneys. 
So the moment you see bilaterally small kidneys in a person without any particular cause, you have to think of CTID, you are not finding out any cause and because it is small, there is no chance that you can actually do a biopsy and you are not going to get anything out of doing a biopsy. So this is the general picture in which they present. So when you see a patient who has got bilaterally small kidneys without any major other symptoms and then you are seeing that the patient has had some polyurinectoria or something like that, then you probably think it is a CTID and you try to, figuring out, try to figure out the cause. Many times you may end up not figuring out the cause also okay so it is bilaterally small kidneys if you do a urine and see in this patient albumin may be traced at the most one plus albumin traced one plus will you see any deposits or anything absolutely no deposits no rbcs nothing bland urine sediment is what we call it just the albumin traced one plus and the patient is having bilaterally small kidneys without any major symptoms you fix on this diagnosis called chronic tubular interstitial disease so that is how they actually present is it okay so this understanding is very very clear now there are certain points which are unique for ctid and that is why those points have to be studied in great detail now these questions are very 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 important the first and foremost point is most of the early cases of ctid that i have seen during my md days are basically just the patient coming with anemia the moment you see anemia, we are always taught that you have to look for your renal function test. And the moment you see creatinine 2.5 in a patient with anemia, we think that this is anemia due to the kidney disease without exactly knowing what is happening. Remember, an anemia that is disproportionate to the degree of kidney disease or the degree of renal failure should always make you think of chronic tubular interstitial disease because the major reason for anemia, there are so many reasons for anemia in CKD. We are doing a separate module on that. The most important reason is an absolute or a relative deficiency in erythropoietin. From where is this erythropoietin? actually produced erythropoietin is produced by the peritubular interstitial fibroblast okay peritubular interstitial fibroblast in the cortex and outer medulla so cortical and outer medullary peritubular interstitial fibroblasts are the ones who produce epo and now what is actually going to happen your peritubular region is going to be completely fibrous so when that part is actually getting completely fibrous these cells are no more going to produce erythropoietin and the ones that are coming out the fibroblasts that are being formed from the intrinsic gla population or the fibroblasts which are converted from the pericytes or your mural cells do not produce erythropoietin so because of which what happens is that there is serious erythropoietin deficiency and that is why these patients can present with disproportionate anemia the moment you see a patient who is having ckd ctid the first priority should be correcting anemia. Why correcting anemia should be such a priority? Because these patients are having loss of peritubular interstitium, and that is basically going to lead on to that is basically going to lead on to a lot of anemia. I have seen a patient who got posted for a polypectomy, okay, uh, nasal polypectomy. This patient had uh, basically a, this is a case of a female, 35 years old, who got posted for upper uh, respiratory tract symptoms, including nasal congestion and all those stuff, and was having a lot of issues with respect to anosmia, found out to have a polyp on CT and posted for surgery. While being posted for surgery, patient's hemoglobin was only 6.5. Because hemoglobin was only 6.5 and then the routine evaluation showed creatinine of 3, they gave a nephrology consultation. When we went and saw this patient, hemoglobin is only 6.5, creatinine 3, ultrasound we did, ultrasound is showing bilaterally contracted kidneys, urine we are showing is showing only albumin trace. So we made a straightforward diagnosis, it is chronic tubular interstitial disease and anemia is part of this chronic tubular interstitial disease. We worked up that patient and eventually that patient was found to have Jogren syndrome. So when you work up, you may finally find out something else. So it's very, very, very important. Anemia is a major, major component here. So that is one thing you have to remember. Now, second thing that you have to remember is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So why nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? I think it's self-explanatory. The moment you are having a problem in your counter current exchange mechanism, you are going to get what? You are going to get diabetes insipidus, invariably. Diabetes insipidus means that you are actually passing a lot of urine, you are having water diuresis or you are having polyuria. You can actually see the module on that. Now, this nephrogenic diabetes insipidus actually means that, are you having enough ADH here? Yes, you are having enough ADH. When you are having enough ADH, because ADH is coming from the posterior or the hypothalamus, so there is no issue there. This ADH has to come and bind to its receptor. Where is the receptor? That is on the basolateral membrane of your collecting duct. What is happening to the collecting duct? It's a tubule and it's in the interstitium. Invariably, it's getting fibrous. So, ADH cannot come and bind. When ADH cannot come and bind, invariably, you'll be having nephrogenic diabetes. That's why these patients are typically characterized by polyuria. Very, very important. They're characterized by polyuria and they have what is called 
wasting what kind of wasting they can have what is called salt wasting because aldosterone also cannot come and bind to its receptor so invariably you are going to get salt wasting this is very very important to remember in the case of a child because in adult also you will be having polyuria salt wasting but they don't manifest so much okay they don't manifest child because in his growing age this polyuria salt wasting can actually manifest as failure to thrive okay in a child it can actually manifest as failure to thrive and very very importantly there can be a growth retardation there can be growth retardation this is so very crucial to understand because proximal tubule is there your collecting duct is there what is the function of the collecting duct predominantly the main function of the collecting duct predominantly is to excrete out h plus if you don't excrete out h plus you will have acidosis if you have acidosis you will have growth retardation that is one way to look at it. Acidosis also on the other hand will promote calcium resorption from the bone. When it promotes calcium resorption from the bone, again what will happen? You will be having osteopenia and you will be again having a defective mineralization and defective mineralization is again going to lead on to rickets like changes. Same way in the proximal tubule is getting involved. When you have a proximal tubular involvement, what can happen? Proximal tubule is the most important one with respect to phosphorus reabsorption. Phosphorus is not getting reabsorbed. You will be losing phosphorus in your urine. That is again equal to rickets. So essentially what happens is you will be having growth retardation and rickets in children which is very prominent to see because it's either a proximal tubule getting fibrosed or collecting the getting fibrosed so both of them getting fibrosed in due course and that can manifest in these ways okay so growth retardation is very 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 important right number five is this very very important phenomena called rta type 4 rta type 4 so this is something which i have seen myself now my senior actually told me this so there was a patient who was having a ckd was chronic tubular interstitial disease that was due to reflex nephropathy and this patient's creatinine was 2.2 milligram per deciliter 2.2 milligram per deciliter but i was finding that this patient was getting dialyzed which I really could not understand. This patient was undergoing dialysis. It is not that this patient was started now, it was started before itself. And that time also the creatinine was only 3, it was not beyond more than that. This patient was regularly undergoing dialysis, which I failed to actually come into terms with. That is when my senior actually told me, this patient is not undergoing dialysis for uremia. This patient is not undergoing dialysis for any value of creatinine. Per se, we don't do dialysis for any value of creatinine. This patient is undergoing dialysis because in chronic tubular interstitial disease, there are certain patients and sometimes many patients who actually have disproportionate hyperkalemia. Who have disproportionate hyperkalemia. That is actually speaking disproportionate to the degree and duration of your kidney disease. Which means that you may be having a mild renal failure only. That means creatinine may be 2 or 3. But hyperkalemia may be so, so, so very disproportionate. This is called renal tubular acidosis type 4. What means that if you look at the cell called the P cell of your cortical collecting duct. Where who comes and binds? Aldosterone comes and binds onto the basal lateral membrane. It induces a lot of proteins inside the cell which are called aldosterone induced proteins. They go and activate a sodium channel which is called as the epithelial sodium channel. Through which salt and water are coming in. And what is going out? K plus or H plus is going out correct now what happens in this condition this is actually situated in the cortex okay this is actually situated in the cortex it's a cortical p cell cortical collecting duct okay so you're having this part fully fibrous now when this part is fully fibrous what can happen when this part is actually fully fibrous aldosterone cannot come and bind when aldosterone cannot come and bind who cannot be excreted K plus and H plus cannot be excreted. When K plus cannot be excreted, that is called hyperkalemia. H plus cannot be excreted, you get acidosis. This hyperkalemia and acidosis that you see in patients with CTID, where it is disproportionate to the degree and duration of kidney disease, is what we actually call as RTA type 4. So, CTID patients are vulnerable to get extraordinary hyperkalemia. So, be very, very careful with this, especially long standing obstruction patient going to CKD. You can see a lot of hyperkalemia. You can see this with patients having reflux. So, be very, very careful. You may even have to take the patient for a dialysis without looking into any of the other parameters because hyperkalemia can kill you. So, definitely important to put these patients on K bind, put these patients actually on a potassium restricted diet and counsel them properly regarding the need for dialysis, maybe even earlier than expected because of the reason that hyperkalemia may actually be there okay this is very important correct so that is rta and acidosis correct so that is the next thing so there are so many unique unique points about these patients okay each of these unique points we are actually seeing now 
Point number six that you need to know about CTID patients are CTID patients generally are having salt wasting. Okay, they are generally having salt wasting, so it's not common for them to have hypertension. Can CTID patients have hypertension? Is a question that I need to ask you. Can CTID patients present without anemia? Is a question I need to ask you. And can CTID patients have hypokalemia? Is a question that I need to ask you. So this is these are three questions. CTID patients almost always have anemia. The only exception to that is the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, where erythropoietin production is preserved and therein there is no there is no anemia per se so adpkd is the only condition where you don't see anemia again you look at all the kidney disease taken on the whole adpkd is the one where i feel anemia will be the minimum so that is one thing you need to know hypokalemia in ctid it is always always hyperkalemia unless and until you have a fangonis anemia like kind of a picture where there is selective involvement of the proximal tubules. It's not common to see, but there are certain conditions like cystinosis, etc., which can produce that. So there alone, because you're having selective involvement of the proximal tubule, and proximal tubule involvement leads to salt wasting, and that salt wasting leads to secondary hyperaldosteronism, and that leads to hypokalemia. You may get hypokalemia. So just keep that in mind. Same way, can you get hypertension? To get hypertension, this is a salt wasting state, isn't it? When you're having a chronic tubule initial it's all about salt wasting. Can you get hypertension? The only way you can actually get a hypertension is, see, each part is getting fibrous to fibrous fibrous. The last part to get fibrous is actually the juxtaglomerular apparatus due to some reason. So when juxtaglomerular apparatus is the last part to get fibrous, you may be in a setting where only the juxtaglomerular apparatus is working and the rest is full fibrous. And juxtaglomerular apparatus can actually produce renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. That can actually lead on to hypertension. So this is probably called as the salt sensitive hypertension. So some patients may have this. So don't think that always it is salt wasting. Sometimes you will be getting a hypertension like this. And remember reflex nephropathy is one condition which can directly present with CTID and hypertension. So in CTID there may be hypertension. One example is reflex nephropathy. Another example is ADPKD and ARPKD. So ADPKD, ARPKD are conditions where you can get hypertension. There the mechanism is different because polycystin may be seen on the vascular smooth muscle also. That is the reason why you get hypertension there. So reflex, ADPKD, etc. Although we group them under this heading called CTID, they may be having hypertension. So you have to keep these points in mind. Correct. So these are the points. So deterioration of GFR with the insidious onset, very slowly progressive tubular proteinuria. So the moment you have tubular proteinuria, keep in mind beta to microglobulin because albumin is for glomerulus, beta to microglobulin is for tubule, inactive urine sediment, anemia at a very early stage, proximal tubular dysfunction or a distal tubular dysfunction, medullary concentrating defect, salt wasting syndrome, rarely salt sensitive hypertension. Okay, this is the complete picture. Okay, what do you do means you do only transplant. Now, when you actually prescribe drugs for these patients, okay, before you plan for a transplant, how do you prescribe drugs for these patients? When you prescribe drugs for these patients, always keep in mind one thing that is potassium. So, hyperkalemia, you have to be constantly keeping check on. You have to advise them to take a complete potassium free diet and give K-bind if required. It's very, very important. Second thing is these patients can have a lot of acidosis. So, enough and more amounts of soda bicarbonate are required in these patients. This is another very, very important thing. Third, tubular indecision is the site where you get anemia. So, correction of anemia is very, very, very important. Four, fluid deficit correction because they are having wasting per se is very important. So, you have to correct that. Number five, you have to be always wary of vitamin D because activation of vitamin D per se occurs in the so many places it occurs, but 1-alpha hydroxylase is very prominently seen in the tubular interstitium. So when it is not there, you are not having enough active form of vitamin D. When you don't have active vitamin D, there is nobody to inhibit parathormone. So hyperparathyroidism may be there, low vitamin D levels may be there, and bone disease can happen in no time. So because of which, always be wary of this. We'll study along management of this alongside with the CKD per se. So all these things you have to be careful with and plan a transplant as early as possible. This is about chronic tubular interstitial disease. Individual cause of CEDD, one, two points that you have to know. I mean, that alone we will actually see. Okay. Microcystic changes without much inflammation. So, which is that cause for CTID where you get a lot of microcystic changes, especially in the distal tubule, but you will not be seeing the classical inflammatory picture, and that is lithium. And this microcystic change is a very, very common question for the exam. Patchy fibrosis, striped interstitial fibrosis, very, very important question. Patchy interstitial fibrosis, striped interstitial fibrosis, afferent arteriolar hyalinosis, all these things have been asked so many times for your exam. They are all features of calcineurin inhibitor and nephrotoxicity. It can produce patchy fibrosis, striped interstitial fibrosis, afferent arteriolar hyalinosis. Efferent arteriolar and afferent arteriolar hyalinosis seen in diabetes, pure afferent arteriolar hyalinosis seen in calcineurin inhibitors. Saturnine gout, hypertension, CTID. So this is a case of CTID where you are having hyperuricemia. You are having gout because of that. That's called saturnine gout. With you are having hypertension. That is what we call lead toxicity. 
lead and uric acid are so very related to each other. Cadmium causes more involvement in the proximal tubule. You are losing a lot of phosphorus and because of that bone pain, that is called ouch ouch nephropathy. Ouch ouch nephropathy is classical of cadmium. Cad Vacuolation. Vacuolation of both proximal and distal tubule with PCT more than DCT. Classical of hypokalemic nephropathy. Very rare entity. Okay. Hypokalemic nephropathy. It produces vacuolation. So all these terms have been asked for the exam. Okay. Analgesic nephropathy is showing this papillary necrosis, papillary calcification, etc. It's just got historical importance. Nothing else. So you can see fragmented uric acid crystal. So this is called the uric acid nephropathy. Now, rheumatology books actually use another term. They call urate nephropathy. So, I would go by this term called urate nephropathy because uric acid nephropathy is another name for tumor lysis syndrome. So, you better study hyperuricemia causing CKD as urate nephropathy, tumor lysis syndrome as uric acid nephropathy. I think that is a better way to look at it. This is to actually show you all these interstitial fibrosis with dense calcium deposits. This is an intraluminal calcium plaque. So, when you see an intraluminal calcium plaque, I think that should always make you think about this hypercalcemia as a cause for CKD and hypercalcemia in this patient was due to sarcoidosis. Due to sarcoidosis. This is your full vacuolation. This vacuolation is so very classical of hypokalemia. Hypokalemia can produce vacuolation. Okay, so that's about it. So a new disease, a new kid on the block, IgG4 related kidney disease. So IgG4 I have done as a separate module alongside with rheumatology. It's a big topic. It's actually gaining a lot of importance. As far as kidney is concerned, what is that you need to know? It can produce a plasma cell rich interstitial infiltrate in the kidney. There is IgG4 containing lymphocytes and plasma cells. And it is one of the autoimmune causes for CTAD. You know, I told you sarcoid, I told you Jogren. Now we may have to remember this new kid called Ig, IgG4. The pattern of fibrosis is called storiform fibrosis. Histological appearance is called maple wood grain or bird's eye pattern. Okay, always remember that it doesn't happen in one go. You may be having involvement of the lacrimal gland. You may be having involvement of the pancreas, renal thyroid involvement. You may be having involvement of the five the Retroperitoneum, retroperitoneal fibrosis. The three most important things that you have to remember with IgG4 involvement are number one and most important, which you see in almost every patient autoimmune pancreatitis, retroperitoneal fibrosis, renal thyroiditis. So please go and see the module on IgG4 related kidney disease. And this is the IgG4 pattern. This is called a typical story form pattern. Okay, story form pattern. Okay, and this is your bird's eye appearance, what I told you. Story form pattern. This is the classical bird's eye appearance. Okay, bird's eye appearance or the maple wood grain appearance, what we actually call it. Okay, now finally, something that is being discussed world over, world over, world over. Such a big, big, big issue. We really don't know why this happens. This is called CKD of unknown etiology or CKDU. CKDU has got so many bells. One is in Mexico and Central America, where it is actually called as the Mesoamerican nephropathy. India, we have a belt uh, in and around Andhra Pradesh, that is the eastern coast of Andhra Pradesh. You have a district called Srikakulam. Srikakulam is just before you enter into Orissa, that's before Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, so, Srikakulam is en route Vizag. That is from Vizag, you move to Orissa. In the middle, you have Srikakulam. Srikakulam and around that, you have a place called Uddanam. So, that's called Uddanam nephropathy. Again, the reasons are not very clear. We have postulated um, bad water, maybe a uh, lot of heavy metals in the water or recurrent dehydration issues. Sugarcane has been postulated, pesticides have been postulated. There are places in Sri Lanka also where we have seen this. Sri Lanka is one belt, Sri Kakulam is another belt. Mexico and Central America is another belt. Egypt is another belt. We are not really clear as to why it happens. A lot of postulates are actually there. It's more important for you to understand this. So, who gets this uh, young, young middle-aged male, young or middle-aged male, no particular reason, no symptom, no hypertension, no diabetes, no proteinuria. One day having some anemia, going and checking creatinine, 4 or 5, kidney contract. This is CKDU. We really don't know what to do. What are the factors for CKDU? So many factors are possible. It's not even possible to actually study this. I want you to remember two, three things. Ayurvedic medicines, high fluoride in groundwater. Then of course, heat stress, recurrent dehydration, sugar cane. So many things. We use this term called Uddanam nephropathy in India, where we are actually postulated heat stress. We have actually postulated uh, like the recurrent dehydration. The same heat stress and recurrent dehydration was postulated in Mesoamerican nephropathy. Pesticides were actually postulated more in Sri Lanka. And that is actually another place where you do get this. So something that will be again discussed again and again discussed in the years to come. Mesoamerican nephropathy also you can actually see dehydration is actually postulated as a big thing. So dehydration, recurrent, recurrent dehydration, heat stress, uh, poor water, pesticides, so many things are postulated. Nothing is actually definite. 
but this is a huge thing it's gaining what is a voluminous voluminous proportions it is actually assuming now and we are not really sure as to where it is taking us and srikakulam is a belt in andhra uddanam wherein we have first thought about water we thinking about high fluoride content in the ground water as a possible reason sri lanka they were thinking about pesticides we are also thinking about heat stress and recurrent recurrent episodes of dehydration all these are just postulates but nothing very clear so this is about ctid every single cause of ctid i have discussed it's a very interesting kind of a model for me personally because there is still lots to learn there's still lots to explore we are not very clear about it even now even from where this fibroblast comes is actually a matter of debate what actually triggers of this is a matter of debate there is lots to explore and lots to learn probably when we discuss more i think we may have more points to talk on but as far as a practical nephrologist is concerned it's all about correcting anemia all about preventing bone disease all about correcting acidosis all about giving vitamin d and preparing the patient for transplant as early as possible thank you